Hi, my name is Dylan, and welcome to Chapter 11 of the Barron's AP Economics book. I'll be covering Chapter 11 in this video, and what you need to know for the AP exam. Here's what you need to know in, which, here's what you need to know in this chapter. You need to know what monopoly curves look like, what price discrimination is, what natural monopolies are, and how the government can choose to regulate monopolies. So let's first start with the cost curve of a monopoly. A monopoly has the same cost structure as a price as a per, as a perfectly competitive firm. Initially, um, as it produces, the cost will, cost will decrease, but as it produces more, um, the cost will rise as long as the monopoly doesn't change its fixed inputs. So this is identical to the perfect competition um, graph in the sense that they're both parabolas and this is the average total cost. Now the marginal cost is also identical to marginal to the marginal cost of a perfectly competitive firm. It's a check mark shaped and again, same thing as perfect competitive firm. But this is where the di this is where the similarities end. In a perfectly competitive firm, the demand curve is perfectly elastic. It's horizontal, it's straight. But in a monopoly, that demand curve is actually diagonal and it goes down like this. Why is it diagonal? Because in a monopoly the, the demand for the monopoly is the industry demand. The monopoly is the only supplier in the industry. So in, in you know how in a normal the supply and demand graph, the demand curve is diagonal? Well, in this graph, the, the industry demand is the monopoly's demand, and that's why it's diagonal. It's also, the, mono, mono, the monopoly also cannot sell all of its products at the same price. It has to lower prices if it wants to sell more, and that's why the demand curve is like this. The marginal revenue curve is below the demand curve, and it's also diagonal. And as I was, as I was saying before, the monopoly cannot sell all the goods it wants at a, at a certain price. In order to sell more goods, it has to lower prices. And that's why the marginal revenue curve is diagonal and downsloping and below the demand curve, because every time the, it wants to increase output, it has to lower prices for every, all the goods, and therefore it makes less money per good. Now let's just label an important point. point, important point. The monopoly is going to produce right here the equilibrium point where marginal cost is equal to marginal revenue. And notice how this point is different than a perfectly competitive firm. It's higher than it's higher than the ATC, which means that there's going to be economic profit. And right here, we can just shade this box right here, the difference between price and um, cost, and this is called economic profit. There's also a few more things you should notice. Um, there's going to be deadweight loss right here in this little triangle. That's deadweight loss, and this is because the monopoly doesn't produce at a point where um, price is equal to marginal cost. It produces actually above it, so there's, so there's deadweight loss. It's not that efficient. And right here, this is your consumer surplus. This is someone up here is willing to buy something for this much, but it's only paying. He's only paying this much, and this is your consumer surplus. So the next topic is called price discrimination. Price discrimination is a firm's way of trying to get the maximum price out of each consumer that he's, he or she is willing to pay. And you, while this is unrealistic, firms will use various tactics to try to get consumers to pay more than if they hadn't price discriminated. This, by definition, will turn some consumer surplus into economic profit for the firm. As I said before, consumer surplus is the difference between how much a consumer is willing to pay. And what the, what the firm wants to do is it wants to reduce that surplus and turn it into economic profit. In order to price discriminate, the firm has to be able to distinguish um, different kinds of buyers. Not everyone wants to buy a uh, certain type of good, and so the, the, so the price discrimination doesn't the point of price discrimination isn't to alienate buyers; is to try to ex try to get more money out of them. So you, do, by if the monopoly attempt to price discriminate ends up costing them consumers, then it just that then they lose money, and that's the and that's not the point of price discrimination. So they have to be able to tell the different kinds of buyers apart. A firm also needs to be able to enforce no resale of the good. Others, otherwise, people who, buy, who are able to buy the good at a low price can just resell it at a higher price, and this may just may this, again makes the monopoly lose money. And also, the price differences can't be a result of cost differences, and the firm has to be able to make its own prices. The three, there are three types of price discrimination. First degree price discrimination is also called perfect price discrimination. In this model, the firm is able to charge exactly what the maximum price each customer is willing to pay. This is essentially impossible. Second degree, second degree price discrimination is creating various product versions so that the firms can get more profit. These are tactics such as bulk ordering, creating premium versions of goods, and etc. 
The last type of price discrimination is called third degree, in which firms isolate the markets into groups of people and target them specifically. These are things such as student discounts. Price, perfect price discrimination is able to achieve allocative efficiency by limiting deadweight loss. This is because normally there are some people who buy who would buy the good at the at the price, but because the because the monopoly is charging too high a price, they won't buy it. However, in perfect price discrimination, the monopoly is able to charge those prices because um, because they can charge they can charge different prices to everyone. In perfect price discrimination, all the consumer surplus turns into economic profit. So right now, this is a graph of per perfect price discrimination versus a regular monopoly. This right here is a regular monopoly. This right here is a perfect discrimination monopoly. So you see, as you can see in a regular monopoly, the, M, the marginal revenue curve is this blue line right here, and it's downsloping, and it's below the demand curve. But in a perfect dem, uh, descri price discrimination graph, this, that marginal revenue curve ends up turning into the demand curve. So this red line is both the demand curve and the marginal revenue curve. This is because in a regular monopoly, they have to lower prices to sell more goods. So they, therefore, they make less money every time they sell a higher output. However, here, if they want to increase output, they can just sell it at the lower price. But the origin, the, the goods that are already sold don't have to be sold at a lower price because people, they, people different, different people are willing to buy different goods at different prices. So they can charge someone a high price and someone else a low price. And this, is, this turns the margin revenue curve into the demand curve. And so what this does is it turns all this consumer surplus right here and this deadweight loss right here, and it turns that into economic profit for the firm. Now there's no more deadweight loss and there's no more consumer surplus. It's all economic profit. So now, now you can see why a firm wants to price discriminate. They're able to achieve allocative efficiency this way. So in a traditional monopoly, it is neither productively nor allocatively efficient. It's not allocatively efficient because it produces at the profit maximizing output. It, but, with, but, the, but the profit maximizing output is an extremely high price but low output. And the, it's not productively efficient because the price is not produced at the minimum ATC. The, the monopoly produces too few output to truly maximize economies of scale and, and truly maximize its fixed inputs. And so therefore, it's not productively efficient. And this causes deadweight loss. And the monopoly, an economic profit the monopoly absorbs causes less consumer surplus. So natural monopolies are a special type of monopoly. Natural monopolies usually exist in industries where fixed costs are extremely high. In these type of industries, it's usually more efficient to produce under one company because it can truly maximize its economies of scales. These are industries such as electrical utilities. In an electrical utility industry, you need to build a lot of power generators. If you have a lot of firms, each firm will want to build its own power generators, and that's extremely expensive. However, if you have one firm, it can just build one power generator and just hook more people up to it, and that's very cheap. So therefore, having lots of firms is inefficient, as prices will be higher than under a single monopoly. These high costs leads to high barriers of entry, so competition is scarce. The government will sometimes choose to support natural monopolies due to the increased efficiency of it. The natural monopoly will also have a huge comp cost advantage over its competitors because of its huge size. The most important thing to remember about a natural monopoly is that the, is that the average total cost is always decreasing, and the marginal cost is less than the average total cost at all points. This is because the huge fixed costs are spread over a large output, and the variable costs are insignificant compared to the compared to the average compared to the fixed costs. This graph here shows how the average total cost is always decreasing. Notice how it starts out really high, but it just keeps decreasing, and since marginal cost is below it, it's just going to keep decreasing forever. The demand is downsloping, just like a regular graph, and the mar same with the marginal revenue. Again, the monopoly will not to produce at MR equals MC, and but however, this brings up a problem. Right here, it's, it's an extremely high price and a low output. And that just causes the problem that the natural monopoly was going to solve. It was going to solve the problem of high, out, of high prices and low output. So the government can choose to step in and force the monopoly to produce at, at either, one of, at either fair, the fair return point or the socially optimal point. The fair return point is where price is equal to average total cost. And socially optimal is, equal to, is, is where price is equal to marginal cost. Again, a monopoly will want to maximize its output, but sometimes the government will maximize its profit. But sometimes the government will deem that output too low for the good of society. By putting price restrictions, the government can force the monopoly to produce at fair return, but the monopoly can recoup the cost of production. Socially optimal is the, is the other choice, but at this point, price is less than average zero total cost. Therefore, the monopoly will never choose to produce at this, produce at this point because it's losing money. The government then has to subsidize production and give the monopoly money to produce at this point. That's it for this video. 
Thank you for watching. I hope you learned something from this video.